الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور ارش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابو القاسم محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his name I begin with, tells us in the Holy Quran that Allah will test us with loss of life, fear, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to stand firm with patience. And Allah gives us the good news, says, فَبَشِّرَ الصَّابِرِينَ أَلَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبًا قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المقتدون. Allah gives the good news to the patient ones who, under trials and tribulations and difficulties, they never lose focus of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa taala created them, and that the only reason Allah created us is because of His infinite mercy. And He has granted us guidance and a guarantee that we were not created for hell, we were created for paradise. It is just that with our limited free will, we have to engage to ensure that we do not lead ourselves astray from the intended goals of why we were created. Tonight, my respected brothers and sisters, those of us who are commemorating the شهادة أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه الصلاة والسلام إمام علي عليه السلام is the sky on the ultimate role model of how one should obey the Holy Prophet. There is no better person on earth that can be a role model as to how we should live a life on this earth as believing Muslims and submit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the path of the Holy Prophet like Abir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad And I send condolences to the world, the entire world that while we are remembering this tragic departure of our blessed Imam that he gave and sacrificed himself and his entire family for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its beneficiaries are you and I. That hopefully tonight when we commemorate his departure and while we make dhikr tonight and the night of Laylat al-Qadr, that we remember the spirit of why we are praying to Allah. It is because of such people who have helped us and protected us from misguidance. Imam Ali alayhi greatest moments in life that were shown on the battlefields, on the seat of justice, on the moments when he had to protect the Holy Prophet even as a child, as you know, when the messenger was declaring Islam to the people of Mecca, they used to send children to throw stones at the Holy Prophet, throw rocks at him. And they were calling him a magician, and they were calling him Majnoon, crazy. And he found there was always this young boy who used to go with the Holy Prophet everywhere who would attack any attacker. If anybody attacked the Prophet, he would go after them and chase them away. He was the one who was the protector of the Holy Prophet in physical states and in the spiritual state. Because when the Prophet says, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Babuha, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is his gate. It's not only the metaphor, the spirit of it is true. For Imams, the role of an Imam is to protect the message of the Prophets. All, according to Al Kafi, all messengers who deliver the message to mankind had disciples called Imams who are guardians and protectors of the message. Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him, had 12 disciples, as you know. And according to our school of thought in Islam, all these 12 disciples were good and they were submissive to Allah and not a single one disobeyed Allah. Not like the other schools that say, when I say schools, I'm talking about other religions that say there was such a person called Judas, for example, or people of such nature. It did not happen. 
In fact, the Hawariyun, who were the disciples of Isa salam, were submissive completely. And they obeyed the Messenger, and they protected the Messenger of Isa salam. But when you look at comparatively over time, you find that the Imamas that finally protects the message of the Holy Prophets, which are none than the 12 Imams that we're talking about, you find that Imam Ali salam, was that ultimate protector who lays the foundation of protection from the very early stages of the Prophet's message. As you know, the first person, male person, to join the Prophet's mission in Islam was Ali ibn Abi Talib and please don't entertain this nonsense that he was a young boy and therefore his value of acceptance is less and you have to be an older man to accept the, uh, the message of the Holy Prophet you'd have to be out of your mind to say that because an older man naturally is the one who's going to be more reflective towards God. It's the young ones who are usually forgetting God. So if a young one accepts Islam that early and joins the Prophet, he's not ordinary, he's extraordinary. There's a difference between ordinary people and extraordinary people. And Allah shows that extraordinariness when Jesus, peace be upon him, declares his prophethood in the cradle. He says, I am a servant of God. I have been given, I have been made a Daniel Kitab, I have been given the book, the gospel. As you know, Isa was the talking, walking gospel. He is known as the word of God, even in the Quran. Why? Because he is moving as a spirit of God. All prophets were like that. They were the essence of God's uh, spirit in, on earth in the sense of in manifestation of Allah's presence. Prophets and Imams are a manifestation of God's presence. Not to be worshipped, but as a manifestation of Allah's infinite mercy through guidance and through submission to them that we have to follow them. That even in the Bible when Jesus says, I am the shepherd, ye are the sheep. None shall enter the kingdom of thy father except through me. Isa is saying, I am your guardian, your guardian, your guard, your protector. If you don't come to me, you will be lost. That's perfectly a good sentence. Isa is Jesus never lied in his life, ever. Imam Ali is is performing the same duty in the perfection of protections. That he is now guarding and protecting the message of the prophets. That when the Prophet was being struck, he was the one who would stand firm and guard and prevent any harm to the Prophet. And as we know, the role of Imams is to be a reflector of the Prophet. Imams, by our school of thought, the Jafari school of thought, do not bring new laws, do not bring new rules, do not change the laws of Allah and the Prophet. They do not meddle in it. They do not bring innovations. Even good innovations are haram in Islam. You cannot bring new innovations in Islam. Not within the prescription of divine law. You cannot. I can be innovative in designing a car. I can be innovating in designing a chair. But I cannot be innovating in redesigning God's message. I cannot take the Quran and say, I'm going to redesign it. So that's the role of Imams, please understand. And the only role of the Imam is to reflect, meaning whatever the Prophet say, they say it. Anyone who makes a statement other than what the Prophet say, they correct it. They say, no, the Prophet did not say that. This is what the Prophet said. They are known as reflectors. Sadly, those who take authority in Islam or any other religion, and Allah has not appointed them, if God has not appointed them, they become deflectors, not reflectors. They take you somewhere else when you're supposed to go back to Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tonight, brothers and sisters, there are many issues to talk. I know it's noisy, because usually on these nights of Qadr, these doors are quite busy. If you can close that door, please, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. As you know, when you lecture, 
you have to fight many forces. Your mind is in so many directions, and then you've got noise and, and traffic. It's very distracting. And even the Holy Prophet say, when a lecture is given, there is an adab, akhlaq, there is a demeanor by which to enter the place when a lecture is being given so you don't disturb the speaker. Not because speakers are anything special, but it's because if there is knowledge being shared, don't distract it. In this night of Qadr, it is a night of reflection. It's a night of remembrance. It's a night of introspection. It's a night to look at ourselves and challenge ourselves. Forget about challenging anybody else tonight. There is nobody in the universe that needs to be challenged but you and I and our, upon our own selves. I mentioned yesterday we have a spirit. I want to talk about this. To exemplify Imam Ali alayhi salam, if you, want, you and I want to try to understand how did this man as a young boy stand up and the Prophet say, you will be my helper, my successor, my protector. Imam Ali alayhi salam stands up in the house of Abu Talib and says, I. The Prophet asked this question three times to his family. And notice, he only offered this to his family. He never offered this to his companions or to the community. In the house of Abu Talib, Allah says, Wadlu rashiratak al aqrabin Warn your near ones, aqrabin. Why the warning of the near ones? Because the jurisdiction of holding the flag of God has been applied only to a select group of people. And the Holy Prophet is offering it to his family as proof that even within his family, there are only special ones chosen by Allah and they will stand up because they are moving, talking, living spirits of God. There is a nine-year-old and the Prophet is asking, who will help me? Imam Ali Aleyhisselam stands up says, I. In the house of Abu Talib, who was present? Abu Lahab, the uncle of the Prophet who has been condemned and cursed with his wife in the Quran, he was present there too. He's also family. But notice there is a distinction even within the family that even the family cannot become the criterion until and Allah, unless Allah chooses such persons. So Imam Ali Aleyhisselam stands up and you and I need to ask the question, what was in the heart of this young boy to have this courage to stand up in a scenario where people considered the worship of idols to be supreme. And here's a man who's declaring oneness of God, which will imply the destruction of these false gods in the Kaaba, which will imply a major revolution that may cause or cost the lives of the entire family. Imam Ali alayhi salam knew this. He never wavered. He never shook. He never stayed behind. Why? What is it in the heart of this man that you and I should see that will make us gravitate and live in his pathway? You and I typically say, of course he's chosen, you know? He's been given special abilities. That's why he's there. I don't have those special abilities, so don't expect it from me. I beg to differ. I disagree. For if you and I did not have that potential of following their footsteps, then Allah would not have asked us to do so. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُرُوبَكُمْ You claim to love Allah? Allah says, say to my believers, if you love me, then obey my prophet. Why? So God will love you and forgive you your sins. That means you and I have the potential of being very close to prophets and imams. Let us not use this excuse to say, no, 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 I was born damned and doomed, or I am so marginalized and limited in my capacity to know Allah that I can never be near Ahlul Bayt. This is shortchanging ourselves. This is like saying that there are many layers of paradise. I don't want the upper layers. I'll try to put my foot in the door of the lowest paradise. At least I've succeeded. Is this a sign of a wise person or a foolish person? Foolish. Wise people don't talk this way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with that capacity by which you and I can be companions of the Prophet, even in paradise. You and I, though we haven't seen him, Though we did not move with him, though we, not, we did not go to battles to defend Islam with him, yet you and I can be his companions in paradise. How is that possible? Let's discuss it. Imam Ali is showing us methods by which to understand. And subhanAllah, if you see all his conversations, he is at the heart of the scenario where his spirit is with Allah. 
Yesterday I touched on this briefly, I'd like to discuss it a little bit more tonight. So that when we shed a tear, when we reach the conclusion where the life of this blessed Imam is taken from this earth by the angel of death, and when we commemorate 14 centuries later to say, I'm alive and I recognize my great master, that he gave his life to save me and he gave his family to me, then let us touch the spirit, not the mechanics of the Imam. Let's not be in awe that yes, he was such a valiant fighter. Oh, look at how he swung his sword. No, we're not interested to know that. Of course we know that. It's obvious. I want to know what was the spirit behind this person that made him swing the sword so fearlessly. What was it that when Amr is threatening him, he comes out and he's not afraid of a giant? What did Dawood have that did not put fear in him that he stood in front of Jalud, which is Goliath, and had no fear to kill him? What is it that these prophets have that when they are being taken by kings and they are being beheaded, like Yahya ibn Zakaria, the son of Zakaria, Yahya, you find he's not afraid, for the Roman king tells him that sign a decree for me to commit a sinful act. And Yahya ibn Zakaria says, no, I will not do that. He said, then I will behead you and have your head delivered on a platter. Yahya ibn Zakaria says, I don't care. What is it in Yusuf alayhi salam that when he is cornered by a beautiful woman who has taken him as her slave and he refuses to bow to her beauty? What is it in Yusuf? He says, when she says to him, come to me. We are all animals at the end of the day to some degree. We have passions. I can just imagine Yusuf alayhi salam to have been deprived of such animal instincts that now a beautiful woman is calling him in a private chamber and you and I can unleash a thousand reasons in front of God to say to God, yes, I had no option but to accept it. Yet Yusuf alayhi salam says, I refuse, I seek refuge with Allah. What is it in this man that has the guts to say that under these very extreme conditions? What is it? How about our women? Sisters, what is it about Asya bin Tabuzahim, the wife of the Pharaoh, rich, powerful. What is it in a woman that while her husband is a king and she can bask in her glory to be the wife of the wealthiest man, the most powerful man on earth as far as they were concerned, that she, she lets go of that in search for Musa alayhi She takes this little child and she raises him only to be in pain and suffering that Fir'aun used to punish her all the time for her love for Musa. What is it in a woman like this? What is it in Maryam that she refrains from dealing with men? That even when Jibra'il, who is a handsome young man who comes and stands in front of her to come and bring her the good news of a blessed son, she takes refuge. She said, who are you? Don't come near me. What is it in a woman of such quality that has made such a submission that under all conditions, thick and thin, they don't waver from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know what it is? I'd like to introduce a little bit of it. I know you know it. Yesterday I mentioned it. When Allah breathed His Spirit into us, this ruh, the angels were commanded to bow. You know why they were commanded to bow? Because you and I have a very special spirit. It is so special that even the angels did not know its value. You know, angels are completely submissive to Allah. But you and I have been given something special, extra special. Even angels didn't know what it was. He says, Oh Allah, you want us to bow to this? We worship you. Allah replies, Indeed, I know that which you don't know. Allah has embedded in us a spirit that is so supreme that even angels have to bow to it. That spirit does not waver away from Allah. It's in all of us. We all have.
have it. But you know why we don't see it? Because we've covered it with ill behavior. We've covered it with ignorance. We have become passionately material that we have covered it. Let me describe it briefly. You will see that we as human beings have two parts, nafs and ruh. The nafs covers this ruh, if you want to use it as an analogy. And when you and I do good things, this nafs becomes transparent, becomes pure. And the light from the ruh starts to emanate from the face. And you naturally gravitate towards Allah. And you are just passionately in love with God. And you give your life for Him, you never get tired. And you are so in tune with Allah, that even if a beautiful woman corners you in a room, you say, I can't accept it. It doesn't fit my ethos. But when you and I commit sins, and we cheat, and we lie, and we allow our animal instinctuals to take over, and we become arrogant like Iblis, that's why the example yesterday, when Iblis was asked, why did you not bow? He said, he's made of clay, I cannot bow to it. Look how material Iblis is, how foolish and stupid he is, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him. Allah raised him and elevated him to a high position. He sees the angelic beings, but he just doesn't get it because he's a mechanical beast. When you and I are mechanical even in Salah, and we don't ponder even for 10 minutes to say, why am I doing this? What is it in it for? What's the passion behind it? We will become mechanical beasts who will pray and kill, just like those slave owners who used to go to church on some days and they used to whip their slaves before they went. Like those slave owners of the Muslims who used to go to worship in Jama'ah and come and beat their slaves. It happened all the time. How? How can you dare to worship God? and perform these evil deeds at the same time. How is that possible? It's not possible. It's because we haven't touched the spirit. Look at the verse in the Quran. Allah says, my believers are the ones when they hear the verses of God. And who are they? And when they are given dhikr of Allah, their hearts palpitate. Why? Because the spirit inside that is embedded in all of us touches the reality with God. Just like the Quran, you notice, the Quran which was revealed in Laylat al-Qadr, which took 23 years to be delivered to mankind contextually, was delivered in spirit in one night. What is that spirit? That's the essence of the reality of the universe. And notice, even the Quran which comes in a spiritual form, comes from a guarded tablet. The Quran comes from a guarded tablet. What's this guarded tablet? It has no language. It's real. It has no language, brothers and sisters. When you excite it, it brings language forward in the sense of our transactions, but it cannot be explained. The spirit you and I have of Allah is like that. It's like a love relationship. I give you a simple example. When you're in love with someone, truly, truly, not the fake kind of love. The true kind of love, and if I ask a child, how much do you love your father? He says, very much. Explain it, please. He says, well, my father does this for me, does that for me. I said, oh, come on, that's all material stuff. True, but these are just words. Is it because your father pays for your school? Well, well no. Then what is it? Uh, you know what? I can't describe it. My love is so great. I said, how great is it? Give it to me measurement. He says, I can't stop the measurement. It's infinite. I said, there you go. Notice it's got no language. Now take it to a higher level, which is where love even gravitates towards. It's the spirit. The spirit of Allah is even higher. And you and I, and I'm going to repeat it, you and I have it. We don't need to get it. We have it. We obfuscate it meaning we cover it, we prevent it from expressing itself by our misdeeds. Imam Ali says, not jaffat al-damu illa li kaswat al-kuloob, wa ma qasat al-kuloob illa li kathat al-dunoob. Tears don't come out when hearts are hard, and hearts don't become hard.
until they are filled with sin. Notice, Hulub here is the same. It's the, it's the location where the spirit lies. It's not this heart, by the way. It's the heart of my body. Scientists will tell you the heart of your body is your brain. That when you are technically brain dead, you are dead. And by the way, scientists have proven, and even according to the hadith, the last... It is 
is not in the prescription of Allah to this guy, ever. That's the beauty, that even when an atheist, a non-believer is talking to you, the Spirit of God is in this person. And the Spirit of God is hidden because so many false ideas have covered the Spirit, it doesn't know what else to see. That's why Allah says, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا In their hearts is a disease. What's this disease in the heart? It's covered. Covered with lies. Covered with facades and innuendos that are not true. Like when you and I go to weddings or parties, we put on a show, a facade. I'm tough, I'm cool, I'm rich. Here I am. It's a facade, it's fake, it's not real. You will usually see real people at funerals, not at weddings. Funerals is when the real stuff usually shows up. But even then, we've mastered the art of masking it in there. We wear nice suits and we look very, you know, gentle. We put on a sad face, of course. Got to. It's usually the few who are really giving tears, realizing what the loss was. We try to console, but at the end of the day, as soon as we get out of there, our backbiting starts again. It doesn't stop. Even sometimes at the funeral hall. Oh, you see that one? Look at that one over there. Oh, look at this one. It's a funeral. For God's sake, give it a little time. No, because we are just so covered with this mess of lies that we have created and concocted over our lifestyles that we think it will give us success. Allah says, One who impurifies it will not be successful. 100% because the spirit will not see it. I want to give a few examples really quick. I gave this example before and I've seen it. By the way, I want to give you one quick example before I get to that one. When you and I are busy in the thick of Allah, let's say you and I are sitting right now talking about God, truly God, with no strings attached. And we're discussing the infinite mercy of Allah. And we're recognizing how grateful He is, how grateful we need to be, and how merciful He is. Like we did the Ajash with the Ya Nur al Nur, Ya Nur al Fafakul al Nur, Ya Nur al Ba'adakul al Nur. Do we reflect? When you and I really touch that, and you're really in touch with Allah, Dhikr, and someone comes and says something bad to you, it's going to be very hard for you to lose your temper. When you and I are in touch with God, trust me, bad behavior just goes out the window. We become calm, we become reflective, we're very careful with what we say, because the presence of God is in my mind right now. That's why we ذكر الله كثيرا لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا. In other words, the messenger is your best example for who the one who wants to return to Allah. Really, لمن كان يرجو الله and they know that they have judgment and they remember Allah a lot. Why? Because the minute you touch your spirit and your spirit starts to gravitate towards Allah, our bad behaviors go out. Simple example, modesty. I was in Dubai having a discussion with a Christian Catholic girl from the Philippines. I've given this example before. I want you to feel it again. She was wearing a three-quarter sleeve shirt, having a discussion with me about why Christianity is right, and I, and I was discussing with her why Islam is correct. And we were sitting in a room. She was a very good girl, very well-behaved. And as we were talking, she wasn't wearing a scarf, by the way. We were sitting there, she was sitting, you know, on one side, I was on the other side, we were talking. And we started to go into the Bible and so on. And I say, let's talk about God, the Father, that you call the Father. Let's talk about Him. He's the object of our conversation. And I started talking to her, and I was telling her about His infinite mercy. Look at how He has shaped us. All of these cannot be probabilities. These are all the infinite mercies of God. That we cherish life. That when we are sick, we become very sad. Allah is warning us. When you were healthy, you thought you didn't need me. But when you became a little sick, look how you talk to me. Because you know your money is not going to buy you help. It's the prayer that's going to buy you help. So in the process, this girl started taking her scarf, her three quarters to give and pushing it down. She kept doing this for a good 10 minutes as I'm talking to her. And everybody was looking at her thinking that maybe the room is cold. But it wasn't, it was very hot. So then why is she doing And something in my mind saying, she must have touched the Spirit of God. And she has realized she 
she's not modest in this present. That three-quarter sleeve is too exposed. Now, we were not talking about hijab. We were not talking about the scar. We were not talking about a woman being subservient to a man. We were not talking about Maryam salam. We were talking about Allah. That when Allah's spirit touches my spirit, which is in me, suddenly I realize that my behavior needs to be better. I don't need a lecture after that. My spirit knows it already. It's got no language. It just knows for a fact what it needs to do. Allah has taught it before he put it in us. This is the infinite mercy of God, brothers and sisters. That our sisters today are taking the hijab from. Some of them say, I say, where in the Quran is this hijab? MashaAllah. Suddenly we woke up from our slumber to realize what is this? Oh, it's a man's rule. Really? Where did the man ever institute this law? If a man could institute this, trust me, he'll be the first person to remove it. Because there's nothing more pleasurable to him than to see a woman exposed. Why would he put such a law on a woman? This is absurd. It's not the man's law. what he said. Mankind, we love to parade our women. We love to go out there to the malls and go and look at what's out there with the wonderful creation of God. Our sisters today say there's no need for hijab. Sisters, with due respect to the brothers too, read the Quran. Quran is not a book to be messed with. It's the spirit that speaks the truth. When Allah institutes hijab for the man and the woman, it's not to entertain Allah. It is to save us from destruction and damnation. Dignity and modesty is the heart of humanity. If you ever want to take to this heart where it will not speak the spirit of Allah, be immodest about it. Be indecent with it. And you will see how wretched it will become. That today, 70% of our children are born out of wedlock. Is that something to be ashamed of or not? Neither doesn't care. You find Hollywood actors and actresses having weddings with their children that they conceive illegitimately, but it's perfectly normal. It's normal to tell the world that I got drunk yesterday. It's perfectly normal to say that I got high yesterday. Hmm? I was stuck on the DUI. Everybody laughs about it. I was stoned. Oh, ha ha, funny. Why? Because we have allowed it to be part of our normal. That today for children in university and high school to get drunk is normal. What we find today in our society is children having girlfriends and boyfriends is very normal. For our children to smoke weed, I'm hearing in our high schools, in football games, our children are readily taking it because somebody concocted the idea that it's good, it's okay, it's good for your health to smoke weed. No, it's not. No scientist on earth will ever tell you that. It's a controlled substance. It's highly dangerous. It's an addictive substance. Nobody on earth can dare say it's okay because it, it relieves my tension. You want to relieve tension? Hmm? SubhanAllah. The, the dhikr of Allah is what makes hearts at rest. Not drugs, not alcohol, not parties, not music. It's the rahmah that a person needs to touch their inner soul. That here I'm talking to a girl just because I spoke about Allah. Without telling her about hijab, she started covering herself. There is a practical application to the hijab 
that the men, when they lower their eyes, when they don't indulge in these indecent activities, like Yusuf alayhi salam, whatever he reads them to indulge. And he says, no, that's the prescription of God if you want to purify yourself. If you indulge in haram acts, one is all it takes, it becomes addictive. Then when you're married, you go through a midlife crisis and you remember with a fuzzy feeling when you were 16, when that girl first smiled at you and she looked at you. And you're living by that dream. Now you're in your 40s and 50s. You've got children, but you can't settle down because you want to relive that little taste you had when you were 16. A sister who refuses to wear hijab many a times, not because she doesn't think hijab is right, but she knows it's going to keep her away from doing something she likes to do before she puts the hijab on. Second like man, when we are asked to do something proper, we refuse to obey, or sometimes we don't like to pray, because when we pray, it will keep us from wrongdoing. We are afraid of that, so we refrain from praying. When we see people pray, we get annoyed sometimes. It's funny how Muslims get annoyed when others pray. Or when a Muslim child comes home and wants to pray, the father gets annoyed. Not because what the child is doing is wrong, it's because the child is reminding the father, Dad, you also need to do this. And that's your problem. So when you and I are disturbed in our ethos, let us question ourselves. Allah said, La uqsimu bin nafsin Allah swears by the self-accusing soul, self-accusing person who says, I have the problem. My soul, my spirit is being covered by my indecent activities. And when we understand this, and you might say, but if I lower my eyes, I will be denied my animal instincts. Well, that's where the trial is all about. For if you and I indulge in it, Allah has given us our power. He says, you want to do it, go ahead. Look, there were kings who had a thousand women, a harem, concubines, thousand. They would get indulged in sexual activities beyond human comprehension. Even the animals would not do it. To the point where these kings would flip the opposite. They would have an aversion to sexuality because they'd be so repulsed by it. Why? Because there's something in the nature. When you push it too far, it becomes repulsive. It becomes ugly. When a person indulges in haram acts, killing, stealing. When a person kills one person, to kill more becomes easy. Today, what's happening in this vigilante, soldiers were being hired and they jump country to country to go and kill people because they are, they are top guns hired and they pay $10,000 a day. These are the reckless ones. They've killed already. They've convinced themselves there is no return. I am going to be wretched like Yazid and Muawiyah and Saddam. Kill them. Who cares? Why? How do you reach that level of apathy where you don't care about the precious life of a human being? When you say kill them, they say Saddam used to throw humans even in meat grinders and feed the fish. How do you do that? Because when the heart is filled with marid, when you go away from Allah, when God has started you with a beautiful spirit, and you tainted it with ugly misbehavior, then yes, you want to touch it. Then the person says, where is God? God is in your heart, Allah says. He is closer to you. God says, we are closer to you than your jugular vein. What's the difference? When we cover ourselves with ugly deeds, this is what happens with us. Then we start to find reasons to violate. And then we start thinking, following reasons. My heart is pure. I love God. Do you pray? No, I pray my own way. I sit in a lotus position and I pray to God. Oh, I said, that's very nice. But do you do it according to God? No, I don't need to do it according to God. I pray my way. Oh, then why are you praying to Him? You should pray to yourself, have a mirror. Because you seem to be smarter than God. Because the way you have decided to pray seems to be better than the one you pray to. Because you never bother to ask Him, what does He want from you? When Allah institutes hijab, it's the same thing. We don't need it. I have a clean heart. I can be modest. How about a woman who's not dressed properly? She says, I have a very modest heart. Yeah, but the way you look doesn't look modest. Yeah, but my heart is modest. This is a person who's very confused. He's like a very filthy person. He says, my heart is very clean, but they're reeking with stench. Unless you couldn't find a place to go take a bath, that you're so poor, even then, you will try to scrape it off. But then you say, oh, I'm so spiritual with God. But you're thinking, how does that work? It doesn't work. If you are a 
spiritual person, your inner should be pure, which it is, if you purify, then the outer is going to be pure. And the two connections touches not only ourselves, but touches those around us. Let me give one example of a practical thing, which you might think is absurd, but it's true, it just happened to my mother. There was a lady in Target, right here. A sister went into Target with a brother. True story. She went in and she saw this fully clad Hajjah lady. They are entering Target, right here, dear one. It says, Salaamu Alaikum. And the lady is saying, Do not say anything. So she says, Salaamu Alaikum. She doesn't reply. She's odd. Maybe she's deaf. Anyway, they do their shopping. When they're coming out, subhanAllah, at the register, the same woman comes again. She said, She was an American lady. She said, You say something to me. What was that? She said, I say, Salaamu Alaikum to you. That's the greeting from Muslims. Did you know that? Are you not a Muslim? She said, no, I'm not a Muslim. So the lady looked at me and said, but you're clad in the Muslim garb. She says, I am a psychologist, psychiatrist. And I have studied this dress carefully. And I have experimented with it. And when I wear it, men treat me like a woman. So that's why I wear it. I'm not a Muslim lady. I just wear it because it works. Now, are we going to use her as a reason to wear hijab? Of course not. When Allah decrees the matter, it's not for him to entertain himself. It's for you and I to purify ourselves. Tonight, when we remember Imam Ali salam, let's go really fast. My time is almost up. I'm going to end very briefly. Shahada of Imam Ali is on the same level. Spirit. That Imam Ali salam never wavered on battlefields, in discussions, in his love for Allah, in reciting Quran, in sujood, no one could equal him after the Prophet. A generation of Imams, one after the, another, Nur ala Nur, yahdi Allahu li nurihi man yasha, wa yadrib Allah amthala lil nas. Light upon light, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends them as guidance. What did Imam Ali al-Islam show us? Simple examples. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts him under very difficult situations. Imagine having to sleep in the bed of the Prophet. Daggers have been pulled. How many of us would cover our faces? You know he had to cover his face. For through the window they had to see a man sleeping. And they could not see his face. Then when they jumped in ready to stab, he sits up and never fears. They say he never trembled for a second. Unafraid. Who are such people? Men who are not afraid. They have command of mouth. Allah says to the Bani Israel, the Jews, not Bani Israel, the Jews. Ask for, have this desire to return to me, Imam Ali alayhi salam. Spirit never wavered for a split second. Never. In every transaction in history you study, when it came to justice, for example, when his shield was taken, he never allowed his position as a Khalifa of the time to overtake him. He even told the judge, you're unjust with me, you cannot do this. The judge asked him, Amani, bring your witness. He said, my son Hassan is my witness, but he's not in the city. He says, the judge says, and I'm sorry, I have to give the shield back to this Christian man. Imam says, then it is his. Look, Imam goes through what we call due diligence. When the Christian man walks outside, he comes to Imam Ali and says, I want to follow you. I want to be your follower. Why? Not a man who sells himself because he's in authority, because he's in power, because he's a governor or he's a Khalifa. He doesn't even let an iota of justice go out of its way. That while his shield, which is his shield, was taken by this Christian man in one of the battles, Imam doesn't grab him and kill him. The Christian man says, I want to follow you, I want to be your follower. He wants to do shahada. Imam says, who? Were you forced to do this? He said, how can I, we love Ali and Abi Talib then let's maintain it. If we're not praying, start praying. If there's qada, make it up. That if my Imam could not find an excuse on the battlefield, that even Imam Hussein who's on the battlefield and the enemy is striking him and he has a meager 72 warriors, and he says, stop, it's prayer time. And the historians say he lost half his army. Half in, a, in prayer. Imam says, I don't care if I lose all of them. 
for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the enemies on the other side who claim to be Muslims and they're shooting arrows at Muslims praying. You want to see history in the clearest of forms as to who is right and who is wrong? On Judgment Day, anybody who tells a blind eye to Karbala deserves to be blind in the next world. Deserves it. It's too clear. It is too conspicuous. Imam Ali al Sallam gave him his prayers. And in Salah, he didn't care about anybody. And when he came to his honor, that once when he became the Khalifa, he was riding to a city. And he's riding on a horse and all the people in the city started running towards him. He stops the horse, he comes down and he says, what is this? He said, it is our tradition to honor our leader in such forms. Imam says, stop doing this. Do not do such forms. Why? He says, lest you start worshiping people like us. Don't do this. We are your leaders appointed by God. We are not here to make you worship us. There was a man who was riding a horse and he gets off the horse while Imam is walking. He comes and stands in front of him. Imam says, what did you just do? He says, I got off the horse to come and just to stand by you. Imam says, for what reason? He says, you are my Imam. Imam says, quickly get back on the horse. Let's people start worshiping me. Look at the honor of a man that while he kills giants, he doesn't let him get to his spirit. That he can't even break bread at night. He can't even break bread when he's eating because he's weak. And he says, I am da'if, I am weak, O oh Allah. You are qawi. Anta al qawi. Fa'ni al hamu. Illa al qawi. Who will help the weak except the strong? This is the worship of a man who is completely in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That while he's lying in his deathbed today, listen to some of the statements of Imam Ali alayhi salam. I want you to remember these statements. It is to us. He says, all people, everyone has to meet what he wishes to avoid by running away, meaning death. Death is the place to which life is driving. To run away from it means to catch it. How many days did I spend in searching for the secret of this matter? But Allah did not allow, save its concealment. Allah, alas, it is a treasure of knowledge. Meaning Allah has hidden the time of our deaths. And the Holy Prophet is saying, Allah is merciful by hiding our death so that we continue to strive so that when death meets us, it meets us by surprise. For if you and I are told the days of our death, we may not be able to handle it. And maybe if we knew it, we would stop working. Alas, it is a treasure knowledge. As for my last will, it is that concerning Allah. Do not believe in a partner for him. Look, like Luqman says to his son, وَلَقَدْ عَتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَ إِشْكُ لِلَّهِ وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانَ غِرْهِ وَوَيَعِدُهُ يَا بُنَيَّا لَا تَشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشَّرْكَ بَضُرْهُمْ عَظِيمٌ My son, don't associate anyone with Allah. Why? Because when I associate that spirit in my heart, it will get covered. When it gets covered, it no longer touches God. He says, never make a partner. Concerning the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, do not disregard the sunnah. Keep these two pillars and burn these two lamps till you are not divided. No evil will come to you. Wow, what a profound will. Keep the Prophet and Allah in your vision and be not divided in it. I tell you the secret to the Muslim Ummah's unity is right at this stage. When Muslims get together, I don't care what school of thought you and I belong to, talk about Allah and Rasulullah. Talk about Talk about Allah and Rasulullah. I tell you, in the moment of the Nabi, the Lahi of Rasuli, from Malami of Tabu, believe me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, talk about Allah and the Prophet, and you'll all be united. Even the tribe of Aus and Khazraj, which were killing each other in Medina, who later became the Ansar, were killing each other for petty reasons. And when the Prophet shows up in their vicinity, they bury their swords and they joined the Prophet and they became the famous Ansar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him the Sadiqun You know what Ansar? He raises the state of Sadiqun. What great people you are. What united us? The Prophet and Allah. Holy Prophet. Muslims, all of us. Let's talk about the Prophet. Let's serve him. Let's love what he loves. Let's dislike what he dislikes. Let's live by his standards. And that's all Allah is asking for us. Because when we remember Imam Ali Islam, it's for this reason. He says, every one of you has to bear his own burden. It has been kept light for the ignorant. Allah is merciful, faith is straight. The Holy Prophet is the holder of knowledge. Listen to the last part. He says, yesterday I was with you 
Today I have become the object of a lesson for you, and tomorrow I shall leave you. Allah may forgive me and you. Look what he says, Allah may forgive me and you. Why does he say that? Because he doesn't guarantee himself that though I'm an imam, paradise is for me. Just like Yusuf as great as a man is, with even his brothers and his father are bowing to him, he says, Tawafani Musliman wa alhaqni bis salihin. Let me die a Muslim and put me among the good people. If the foot remains firm in the slippery place, well and good. But if the foot slips, this is because we are under the shade of branches, the passing of the winds, and the canopy of the clouds, whose layers are dispersed in the sky, and whose faces disappear in the earth. I was your neighbor. My body kept you company for some days, and shortly you will find just an empty body of mine, which would be stationary after all its movement and silent, after speech, so that my calmness, the closing of my eyes, the stillness of my limbs may provide you counsel because it is more of a counsel for those who take a lesson from it than eloquent speech and a ready word. Final point. I am departing from you like one who is eager to meet his Lord. I am eager to meet my Lord. Imam Ali used to say every day, I am so eager to meet my Lord. Every battle would come crying in front of the Prophet. He said, my companions got shahada, I do not get shahada. My companions became martyrs, I have not become a martyr. The Prophet looks at him and touches his beard and says, this will stay in this when you become a martyr. Every day, Imam Ali used to wait for that day when his head would stay in his beard. That when if the Muslim struck him, struck him three days, two days early on the 19th, Imam realized this was the call of the Prophet. And the poison is sleeping. He says, I am eager to meet my Lord. Tomorrow you will look at my days, then my inner sight will be disclosed to you. Did you hear that? Listen to this. Tomorrow you will look at my days, then my inner sight will be disclosed to you, and you will understand me after the vacation of my place and the occupation by someone else. You will know my true value. Imam Ali Salam sits, I mean, lies on his bed, he calls Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. He calls his daughter Zainab, so he calls him off. He holds the hands of his blessed son Imam Hassan. He whispers into his ears, the Ruh al Qudus. They say the Ruh al Qudus was shared that even Imam Hussein, before going to the battlefield while Imam Zain al Abideen was on his bed sick, Imam comes and whispers into his ears, and Imam Zain al Abideen holds his father, and his father disperses Ruh al Qudus to his blessed son which continues the Imam, Imam Ali al -Salam, transfers this authority to his son Hassan alayhi salam. He holds the hand of his blessed son Hussein, brothers and sisters. I want you to think about for a moment. Imam Ali al -Salam was well aware of Karbala. The Holy Prophet explained it in details to him. He was well aware of it. And a father who is to hold his son before he brings his master, oh, he would not be known to marry his blessed son Hussein. And then we know what to even give him a clothing when he's dead on the, on the battlefield. How does a father feel? 